Okay, welcome to The Actor and the Engineer. My name is Paul James. I come from the acting background. And I'm Josh Knapp, and I'm a broadcast engineer. Here we go. All right, today we're going to talk about trilogies. But before we talk about trilogies, I wanted to just run through a couple of things that I that have come up that I've got written down that are just and which I know really nothing about. Amazing. Yeah. I, is, oh, really? Oh my gosh. Okay. I'll start off with a big one. Okay. So you know Steven Soderbergh has retired from directing movies, right? What does that mean? Okay. Exactly. Because he did he did uh, Beyond Behind the Candelabra. Yeah. Which right. is technically not a movie because it's it, an HBO it's movie. It's an HBO movie, but it's not a theatrically released movie. Although it probably played at some theater at okay. some point, but making a lot of faces over that. No, one. you know Come what? On. I think that it's. I think what it's doing is it is he is setting himself aside from people expecting a certain thing out of him. You know, Steven Spielberg. Well, he's you know, always done that though. But but what I'm saying is that like Steven Spielberg, people are like, what's his next movie? What's his next movie? You know, right. Christopher Nolan. What's his next movie? You know, okay, Steven Soderbergh saying, you know what? I don't have a next movie, so leave me alone. Effectively, so that's allowed him to. Do behind the candelabra. It's allowed him to direct on uh, Broadway, um, and he. Yeah, but what I don't understand. No, go go ahead. Go okay, ahead. he's also. I was as a part of this. I I read that he did, and I read a couple of his tweets. He did a Twitter novella. So you know, Twitter yeah. is d- is defined by 140 characters. Every tweet can only be 140 characters or less. So he basically wrote lines of a story and would post them every once in a while. And if you put them all together, it's an actual story. That's kind of brilliant. Exactly. That's kind of brilliant. And so he's got his own website where he where he puts all these things together. How often did he send out the tweets? Like I, I don't know. Okay. I, I really don't know. I, I just Well, got... I have to friend him or tweet him yeah, or whatever you call true. it. Yeah. Yeah, we'll have to follow him. And yeah, then follow. We'll, we'll that's get right. To, we'll get to uh, to see what he does from now on, I guess. But uh, what got my ears perked is that in his spare time, he's done a recut of Raiders of the Lost Ark. The first one. The first one. In black and white. What? In black and white as a silent movie. What? With, Wait. With, it gets better, with the Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross scores from Social Network, Girl to Dragon Tattoo. Okay, what? And it's available you, on his website. It's like a two-hour long stuff? movie. Is this just stuff it was you've been on? Looking at? I think it was on Slash Film or something. Right. But, uh, yeah. Okay. I mean, wait. Slow down. That's a <laughs> lot of stuff. You really did hit me with a lot of stuff. You had said before you're not going to tell me what you want to talk about. And whoa. Exactly. Okay. So he obviously has permission to do all this no. stuff. Oh, he doesn't. No, but he has, well, it hasn't been legality? taken down. It hasn't been taken down, and I think it's probably him talking with Steven Spielberg and the people at Lucasfilm and saying, you know, can but I? then he also has to get the rights to the soundtracks for social net i mean how does he what's the i guess you could make a youtube video what's the difference yeah. right i mean basically that's what he's so doing the, a fan edit he's effectively doing a fan edit or a highlight reel it's just his highlight reel happens to be two hours long it's uh yeah it's an hour and 55 minutes long so and it's available on the website i can put the link uh with our with our podcast but and there's no dialogue there's no words there's no in fact he says at the very beginning of his post he says this posting is for educational purposes only so he's i'm not going to read all the stuff that he says but he's basically using it as an analysis of staging so um as far as like how how steven spielberg shot the movie and and how it looks and how you always know where like from the camera placement you always know where you're at and where the the characters are at yeah and and so he's basically boiling it down he's taking all this other stuff out of it he's taking the you know the heightened score and the you know the colors and all that stuff and he's basically focusing on just the camera shots the dialogue, he's not, he's trying to take everything out that can distract you from what he's focusing on. But, and I haven't had a chance to watch it yet. I haven't watched the movie in like, I don't know, two weeks, but because of, <laughs> because everything. we've been moving. And yeah, all yeah, stuff. yeah. But, um, so yeah, it sounds so interesting to me and I just have to sit down and, and, and take it in. I'm fascinated on so many levels. It's a good surprise. This is good. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've often heard that a director, uh, I know a stage director, will make living pictures. They will direct people in certain poses and certain 
so if you were to just take a snapshot of the scene Mm -hmm. and make a a still of it, you would understand what was going on in the scene just by the positions of where the characters were on stage. And my understanding is that film directors do the same thing, that they direct as if there's not going to be dialogue. So if you were to uh, shut off the dialogue and just watch a silent movie, even if, you know, just mute it, you Mm -hmm. would be able to understand the emotional integrity of what's going on. So this is the experiment that proves that theory. So... And that makes a lot of sense because you don't want to just rely on words. You want to rely on some kind of emotional impact by what a person, because it's a visual Mm -hmm. field. Okay, so back to your first thing. You had said that he is retiring from directing, and I kind of rolled my eyes a little bit when I first, because I thought of a billion directors who don't have to explain what their next project are, who do stage Mike Nichols. He, mm-hmm. he does stage. He's done um, an HBO movie, Angels in America. Um, there's a couple people who, and uh, Fincher did House of Cards, mm-hmm. the first episode, and produces some of them, correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I don't really know what is the purpose behind him saying, you know, I'm retiring. But after that, it doesn't matter because exactly. what he's just done is brilliant. Yeah, I was just thinking about him too. I was thinking because we've talked about Soderbergh before about how he does something really mainstream, mm-hmm. quote unquote, and then does Ocean's something. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Speaking of trilogies coming up, mm-hmm. you know, it's on my list. Spoiler, <laughs> and uh, so that's fascinating. I I can't wait to see that. And I can't. I mean, I can't say anything to the content of it because, like right. I said, I haven't watched it. But I'm assuming it's going to be pretty cool. But so instead of spending his time working on a new project or developing the new Sonnenberg film, he's gone. Well, he's sort of He's been... analyzing his craft. I mean, he's basically studying. Yeah. He's, he's studying for a, a test that is not, I mean, that he doesn't, he doesn't have to do this. He could just direct a movie, but instead he's going backwards and analyzing and trying to figure out, you know, what is it about Raiders of the Lost Ark that grabbed him and that made him, you know, that makes him want to see it again or whatever, you know, and he's trying to, it seems like he's trying to analyze that. So where did the idea that he would take two other soundtracks or scores and put them because they're so brilliant? Yeah, I don't know. I think it's because it may, and and I don't know which tracks from each of these scores that he used. Now say it again. It was Social Network and what else? I'm assuming it's Social Network and and Girl the Dragon Tattoo. Those are the only two that that they've done. Okay, yeah, yeah. Now uh, Gone Girl, which we will be reviewing next week, uh, they they also did Gone Girl uh, for uh, David Fincher. Well, so. good for him. I mean, yeah, that, that's fascinating. Good it's, for him. It's really cool. So, um, a couple other small things. Uh, Interstellar. I found out that that movie, which comes out in November, uh, the the new Nolan, Nolan movie, yeah. is 169 minutes long. So, that, so that's almost three hours long. Really? Yeah, which I'm excited about. I love long movies. Yeah, me too. I mean, Quentin Tarantino yeah. does it. I mean, I and it never seems long. And I think some of that for me is maybe like my, you know, I'm putting down my ten dollars and like I want to get as many minutes of a movie as possible. You know what I find in some ways, but then I guess it could be bad. Yeah, I don't too. really look at it that way. What I find interesting is that there's an hour and a half movie that seems like what was the movie we just saw recently? We both thought it was long, even though it was shorter. What was that movie? Was it Boyhood? And it was uh, short, and yeah. it seemed a bit longer. Well, no, Boyhood was very long. Was it? Yeah. What was it that we had seen? I can't remember. I think that was the other way around. It didn't seem like it. I mean, there, there were oh, portions yeah, of you it. Might, but, yeah, you yeah. might be right. But, you know, there are movies that are an hour and a half long that seem very long. Yeah. And it's like, is this ever going to end? And mm-hmm. what is the point? And then there's movies, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. None of those movies seem long to me. As a matter of fact, a couple of my friends wanted to go see them when they did them back to back. Oh, wow. Yeah, they... Uh, oh, AMC did that, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. And it was like a whole day. Yeah. You just And you had like, they give you like free popcorn yeah. or something. Yeah, well, I think you get like a soda after the first one and a popcorn <laughs> after the second one, something like that. I guess <laughs> you got to keep up your energy. I guess. But I would have sat, sat there all day. There's mm-hmm. no doubt about it because we've talked about when i was a kid i used to go to those movies on saturday yeah. and spend all day in the the movie the theater. theater yeah so i don't have a problem with long movie it's long movies that don't seem to have a reason to be that long mm-hmm. you know and they continue on they continue on and you're like we could have gotten this in an hour and 45 yeah. minutes so well, nolan's new nolan's new movies it's his longest movie yet i mean because he's really not known for doing too long of movies dark Knight rises was really long how I long was, was that? 150 something minutes so. it could have been six days long and i would have been okay with it because <laughs> i love that movie yeah yeah i love that Trilogies. trilogy yeah mm-hmm. we'll yeah we'll get there yeah um the uh the other things, I, there were a couple other things. 
uh, that I was going to kind of bring up uh, Paul Thomas Anderson's new movie, Inherent Vice. Yeah. Have you seen the trailer for it? No. I haven't either. I didn't know it was out. It just came out yesterday. Okay. okay. So yeah, um, I've been working so much that I haven't even, IMDb is like, please get me to it. I need it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I haven't been on it for, for forever. Yeah. So Inherent Vice, that movie's uh, coming out. Who's and, in it? Uh, it's Joaquin Phoenix. It's a Thomas Pinchon novel. Yeah, I think you mentioned I've this. Never, I don't know who that is. I don't know either. And <laughs> I mean, I, maybe I should feel bad about that. I well, don't know. I mean, you can't. There's only so much information our brains can take in. I mean, That's this is where we've learned it. Now we got to move on. Oh, yeah, I never I read uh, Cormac McCarthy book until No Country for Old Men, and oh, then I read okay. three or four back to back. Yeah, yeah, I never heard of them before. I See? think I've heard mention of them before, but mm-hmm. No Country. For old men left me with lots of questions. I was like, I got to read that novel, yeah. figure it out. Yeah. So, what were we were talking about? I was uh, talking about inherent vice yeah. and about how it's going to be coming out here. I think it's coming out in the next few months. Joaquin Phoenix. Oh, uh, Reese Witherspoon, um, Josh Brolin. Um, I mean, I can pull it up, but it, there's uh, it's it's kind of set in the seventies, yeah. and and I haven't seen the trailer yet, and I, I I'm really excited to see the trailer. But the thing I wanted to bring up is that. Whereas we've talked about like digital projection versus film in the past, yeah. Um, Paul Thomas Anderson, his last movie, The Master, he was was shot. Some of it was shot in seventy millimeter, which is like the biggest film that you can get. It's very expensive. IMAX actually is seventy millimeter, okay, and, and they have larger frames uh, than seventy millimeter. But anyway, so uh, he's going back and forth between like distributing it in only thirty five millimeter or or uh, the digital format, which is DCP. And so um, I just, I read somewhere that that he has somebody in Hollywood, a projectionist in Hollywood who's on call. Like he's been watching the movie back and forth, like blind testing it, 35 millimeter digital back and forth and trying to figure out if he can tell a difference. And so he's kind of trying to determine whether digital, because he shot it on film. He's trying to determine whether digital projection is like, worth it to to distribute like whether it's going to kind of like do something detrimental to the movie how the movie is being projected what do you think so explain to me and everybody else who doesn't have this engineer mind what are we looking at that's different if it's 70 millimeter and we're looking at it what are we seeing differently than if it's 35 millimeter so you there's more information that's available you can have more information so if you if you've ever like worked with uh, any kind of like pictures on a computer and you like blow up the picture on a computer and yeah. it gets really blocky. Yeah. Well, that's effectively what, you know, what you're, you're doing if you, if you blow up a 16 millimeter uh, black swan. Do you yeah. remember that movie? Yeah. Oh, do you cool. how, okay. I, I know it's hard to forget. Do you I'm, what I'm asking is, do you remember how that movie looked? Like there were especially some grain. It looked kind of grainy. Yeah. Well, that's okay. It looked grainy because it was shot. A lot of it was shot in 16 millimeters. So it was shot on a smaller, right. And a smaller frame. And then that gets blown up to effectively a 35 millimeter size or what we're used to seeing a 35 millimeter size. Okay. So size. somebody uh, shoots in 70 millimeter and then shrinks it down to, to 35 and does it look it d- does look crisper it's able you're able to see a little bit more detail and we're just now getting to the point where 4k projectors are starting to kind of edge 4k is like 4,000 pixels high uh, uh they they're able to or 4,000 pixels wide i guess but uh they're able to uh get close to their same resolution or an approximate resolution of, of film of 35 millimeter film. So people like David Fincher have been shooting in digital since Zodiac in 2006, 2006. So, I mean, there's some people who are committed to it and who, you know, I think David Fincher's movies look amazing. Yeah, me too. Uh, but then there's other people like Christopher Nolan and like, uh, you know, Paul Thomas Anderson. Who shoot only on film. Yeah. And even Edgar Wright, I think. Scorsese. But, yeah, Scorsese, yeah. yeah. Um, so, and it's a lot more expensive now. If it's the, what Scorsese does, then you should go with it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, the big thing now is that basically all the big movie, uh, the big movie companies have like Warner Brothers and, uh, you know, all, all, I mean, all MGM, all those guys, they've basically said to, that we're only going to distribute digital prints. Because it's probably cheaper. Because it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. It's a hard drive, basically. Yeah. Sometimes they can even download it. That's You crazy. just like start... Start the download. It takes you know a couple hours to download, four hours to download, or whatever, because they're huge files, and then it gets played out. The good thing about digital projection is that you never have a bad print, because 
when you think about it, a movie's new. Friday right. night, yeah. movie's new. First time that print has ever yeah. been shown on a projector. Yeah. Every time you run it through the projector, just like old audio tapes, yeah. you know, it gets worse. The hiss gets worse. We well, used on to an burn audio tape. back in the day. Yeah. You used to burn. The, the film would burn. Oh, yeah, yeah. You can't, yeah, depending yeah. on if the bulb is too yeah. hot or whatever. Anyway, so, yeah, you can have detriment or like scrapes on, yeah. the, uh, on the film. So, yeah, I mean, that's the good part about digital, but the bad part is that you could be losing. It may even be some sort of an intangible thing that that Christopher Nolan and, and Paul Thomas Anderson are kind of holding on to the physicality of film running past a bulb going and the light going through a, a, a lens and, and hitting the screen. Okay, so, so if you I understand what you're talking about with 70 millimeter to 35 millimeter millimeter, what would be the difference in the look from 35 millimeter to digital? To digital, would well, you see? Sometimes they say that the colors are different. So meaning that when they get transit when the, when the file gets transitioned to a digital file when it gets converted to a digital file from actual film, colors may be may be off. But once you get those colors locked in, though, I mean it's the same all the way across the country. How does it get? How how do the colors get off? It's it just, just depends on the transfer device that they use. Oh. There's like a big machine that takes the film in and so it's scans like every the every difference frame. between. Uh, downloading something for an MP3 player and putting it on a disc, the way that you put that on an MP3, it, mm-hmm. it, it presses it together more, and so the information is. But it's not. I mean, it yes, it does compress the the. It does compress the. And that can the footage, alter the look of the film. Ultimately, yes, and I think a lot of it has to do with. There's a documentary that Keanu Reeves did actually called Side by Side, and oh, it's yeah, got of people talking. It's got guys like Christopher Nolan, uh, you know, talking about why film is great and guys like David Fincher. Have you seen this? Yeah. Oh. Talking about, and they go into the science of digital filmmaking versus, you know, analog filmmaking, which is film. But, um, and then they kind of, you know, I don't think Keanu Reeves necessarily comes down one side or the other and that, which is good because it's do- a documentary. It's right. It's trying to just show you both sides. But, but yeah, it's definitely worth a watch. And I, it used to be on Netflix, but I don't know if it is or not anymore. Maybe on Amazon Prime or something. But, um, and then the last thing I was going to talk about is since I haven't seen a movie in like two weeks and, and we're going to be doing the Gone Girl um, a Gone Girl review and we've got some other movies that we're going to be talking about soon too, uh, is, uh, and also my wife is going to be working hard on some, some school type stuff, I'm going to watch 31 movies in 31 days. What? In October. What? Oh, okay. Where did this come from? I need... Uh, Goal. Okay. Fair enough. And I'm the same way, dude. Yeah. I'm the exact same way. So where did the idea come from? Did, uh, you, well, you just I, felt the need to watch and you weren't committed to watching. I've been feeling the same way. Ago, I'll be honest with you. Yeah. A long time ago, there was, there was, I was listening to a podcast and there was a guy that came on this podcast and he watched a movie a day, a movie a day for 365 days, like for the whole year. I could do it. <laughs> I could do it. There's not one person who knows me who would... Mm -hmm. say that I couldn't do it. You would not get sick of it. (laughs) Never. But see, so for me, I'm not doing, I'm not saying that. It's a schedule thing for me, like with work and social and... I'm trying to set aside some time. So uh, I'm also not saying that I'm going to watch a movie a day for 31 days. I'm saying I'm going to watch 31 movies in 31 days because I know that there may be a day that I might not be able to watch a movie, but then there will probably be a day where I can watch two movies. In the past, I've watched, there have been days where I've watched four movies in a day. You know, I mean, it's just happened. So anyway. I'm going to sit here and act like not me, but it's, <laughs> I could do it all day long. So, so I've anyway. actually watched two uh, movies at home, rented, mm-hmm. went out to the theater and watched something else, <laughs> came home and watched another DVD. I rented something on the way home from Redbox. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes I don't really like doing that because I'll forget what the first two films mm-hmm. by time, the last two films, like um, double features. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a place in Pasadena when I lived in LA, uh, in California. They, um, like nobody knows where LA is, but. Uh, oh, you mean the LA in California? Yeah. Yeah. That LA. <laughs> yeah. That one, Pasadena. Uh, they had a double feature place that you could also watch a third one. Uh, for a different price, like, you know, you could buy two double features for this price and three for this. And I would mm. go for the three because it was cheaper, one. And they were second run films. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, some of the movies had been out of the theater for a while and some of them hadn't. And by the time I watched the third film, 
I would go home going, wait, what happened in the first one? So sometimes there's got to be time in between, yeah. but I don't really have a problem with it, to be honest with you. I'd do it again and again if I was. Sometimes when I think about winning lottery, that's uh -huh. the first thing I think of. I'm like, I'm going to watch every movie in the theater. I don't care <laughs> what it is. Well, I've got about 15 to 20 movies that I've got just kind of like penciled in, but I definitely want you to pick at least 10 movies that I need to watch. Oh, okay. So, and I've got time too. So that all, I mean, I've got time. Are any of them going to be scary because it's October? Yeah, actually. Um, let's see. I've got the, this, the ones that I've, let's see. Um, the, well, it's the elephant man's not scary, but it's one that's, have you ever seen it? No, the, I'm mm. trying to focus on ones that I've never seen. It's so, good. uh, the Bay, that's actually one that I've heard really good things the about. Bay. It was, it's a, uh, I think it's Richard Donner. Um, no, not, is that right? It's, oh, oh Barry Levins and that's who it is. Okay. Um, yeah, where's he? I knew he it was somebody from, I know. Yeah. But it's a found footage movie, but I've heard from a lot of people that it's actually a good found footage movie. And when done right. Found footage movies. There's a. Well, yeah. There's uh, a term for that? Yeah. The, it started with Blair Witch. Uh, Blair Witch, exactly. And so, um, you know, in Paranormal Activity, all right. that stuff. But I've never seen the Paranormal Activity mm. movies. But. Um, Anyway, so uh, the Bay I've heard is actually a really good, you know. Is that a scary movie? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's okay. it's as chaos oh, yeah. breaks out in a small Maryland town after uh, Barry Levinson is Maryland. Yeah, oh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Baltimore, after an yeah. ecological disaster occurs, so yeah, interesting. But I've seen there's other movies kind of like this, uh, like uh, Quarantine. Have you seen yeah. that? Yeah, it was. I mean, it wasn't a huge blockbuster movie or anything, but like it kept my attention. Yeah, you know, and I like I like movies that have constraints. You know, like the constraint of the movie was we're just in this apartment complex or apartment building and that's it. And so what can you do? You right. know, what I mean, what can the filmmaker do to keep me interested? You know, that's and, and I kinda like that. I like here's the rules. Now we're gonna follow those rules and let's see what happens. So thirty one so. movies in thirty one days. That's cool. Yeah. It's a good idea. Yeah. So um and there's movies that I ha that are on here that like I haven't seen that I want to see that I probably should have seen by now. Both of the Hobbit movies just didn't see the first Hobbit movie, and now the second Hobbit movie's out on DVD, so I need to. And then the, the third one's done. coming out now too. I know. This, yeah, yeah. I saw both Christmas of them. or something. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So there's I got a, I got a bunch. Speaking of, of long here. movies. And then like I have like uh, I have directors here, uh, Woody Allen and Terrence Malick. I've seen like one or two movies from each of those guys, but. That's it, and they're kind of like in a particular pantheon for a lot of people, and I feel like at least to speak about them more intelligently, I should yeah, probably... Yeah, for me, deservedly so on both yeah. counts. I like both of them. I loved The Tree of Life. Mm -hmm. A lot of people had a problem with that. Have you seen that? Mm, okay. Half of it, yeah. I fell asleep. Oh, okay. That's okay. No, 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 <laughs> I love how honest you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? But it was one of those where we were trying to, and, and my wife and I watched it, and I think she may have even seen the whole thing. I don't know. But we were trying to shoehorn it in. It was one yeah. of those, like, I needed to get it back, that type of a thing. And okay, then, that's like, number one on the list for me. You got to okay. finish watching that one. Got it. Yeah. All right, well, it's on there. Um, and then, uh, yeah, I've got I've got some other ones on here, but. I, we should probably get into the, uh, the trilogy topic of uh, the topic at hand. So, but fascinating. Good for you, man. Set yourself a goal. That's a good goal. Yeah. Well, we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you put it on tape. It, on that's recording, right. So I have to, you have, I have to, to stick to it. Back, yeah. You have you to know? stick to it. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, so trilogies, uh, it's an interesting topic because once I started digging into like, Okay, look, first you got to define a trilogy, right? Right. I knew this was going to be the first thing I was going to ask you if you didn't bring this up. I want to see what you, not what other people have said, what you think is considered a trilogy. And my definition of a trilogy is a group of three movies conceptualized to have a storyline completed within the trilogy. Okay. So, and I can also define it by the by the series of movies that are not included in, in my list of, of, of trilogies. Star Trek... Superman, the early Batman movies, even though, did Tim Burton do, no, did he do, two. The, he only did two, that's yep. right, yeah, because, so it's not a trilogy, because Schumacher did the third one, I yes, think. Um, so, the third and fourth, yeah, Alien, it's got four movies, yeah, and, and a fifth if you count, if you count Prometheus, uh, Die Hard, Spider-Man, yeah, but they keep going on and on and on, the Spider-Man might 
be considered you more. You can say trilogy one and possibly trilogy two. Yeah, guess, that's different. Spider-Man. That Spider Man is definitely a trilogy. Up to that point, I don't think any yeah. of the ones you mentioned really constitute a trilogy. Born. Oh yeah, yeah. They talked about that on a lot of uh, websites, mm-hmm. but it continues on with somebody else. It doesn't. Now. I just heard this last week that uh, He's coming Paul back. Greengrass and Matt Damon are coming. Smart, back. smart. Good mm-hmm. for them. And then the Toy Story movies. Yeah. I mean, uh, oh, well, and then the one I don't want to say, but I have to, is Indiana Jones. I mean, you What do you mean you don't want to say? You could say that the first three movies are a trilogy. Yeah. But by the by adding the fourth movie, it doesn't fall into my definition of, of a trilogy. Right. The because only, the story wasn't completed within three movies. Yeah, the only one that I consider a trilogy out of the ones you just mentioned is the Toy Story trilogy. Because of... Well, there's a one part about uh, completing the story in a trilogy that I want to add to that. I also think that the most interesting... there are only three Toy Stories. There are. Oh my gosh. I totally thought yeah. there were four. No, for no, some no, reason when three. I was putting this together. No, okay. there's three. Yeah, uh, well, there you go. Strangely enough, or not strangely enough, interestingly enough, it's the number one uh, trilogy on my list. It, it would definitely be on my... Well, I mean, it is now, but... Here's, you know. here's the reason why. It completes the story, but each individual movie stands on its own doesn't need anything else to explain it. You don't need the second one to explain the third one. You don't need the first one to explain the second one. They can stand on their own. And they built on one idea and kept going, and they continued it on to the third one. And I thought by the third one, uh, you know, it's going to get weak. They mm-hmm. had me going. I watched it with my two little nephews, mm-hmm. and they're like, are you crying, Uncle Polly?" I was like, uh, maybe. Because I really thought, you know, you've seen all three. Oh, yeah. Okay, mm-hmm. I really thought, they were going to burn some of the toys. Well, that freaked me out. At the end, and it seems to me, it seemed to me to be, yeah, like this is a kids' movie, but there are serious no, stakes. Oh, there are serious stakes in that one, and, and all and of even, them actually, all well, of them actually. That's true. The kid in the first, in the one, first that one is scary. The second one, the owner of the antique toys that wants Woody, that's a scary. Yeah. You know, he's eating the Cheetos and got all Nedry. the Cheetos. Yeah, oh, he's yeah. not Nedry. It's Dennis. Yeah. Uh, what's it, whatever his name. Yeah, is. I just call him Nedry from. <laughs> From uh, Jurassic Park. Oh, yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Also Seinfeld, too, right? That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Newman. Yeah, Newman, right. Newman. But uh, the thing that's interesting about the third one, in taking nothing away from the first two, because the first two, I think, are brilliant, too, because the second one, let's go to the second one first. Mm-hmm. The first one is the first one, of course. So sure. it's it, it's all-encompassing in, a, in amongst itself. The thing that's interesting about the second one is where do you take that story? Where mm-hmm. do you go with that story? It's brilliant to realize that they take it to an antique collector of toys because those people exist Mm -hmm. and i know a lot of those people and they really are into that and i know people who refurbish old toys i actually collect a lot of uh batman figures and stuff like that Mm -hmm. action figures not dolls action figures got it all right okay good (laughs) um because my sister's like you got dolls i'm like okay sure action figures but then they build on that and then they make the stakes even higher in the second one and then you introduce new characters who continue on into the third one jesse Mm -hmm. um Joan Cusack, who's brilliant in that, and they they make it, they do everything they did in the first one, then continue it on in the second one, build the story even bigger, and then in the third one, the stakes are higher technically. The stakes are higher technically, and um, what's interesting is is that the things that I find interesting about movies is we we've kind of talked about this before. You'll see a cup on a table and it seems it's insignificant in the first 15 minutes of the movie. And then it comes back to that cup and you're like, Oh, that cup means this. And that was this and that, for example, in toy story, um, at the end of the film, he says at the beginning of the film, the toys say, I just wish Andy would play with us one more time. And then at the end of the film, he takes the toys to the little girl's house Mm -hmm. and he's playing with them. And my nephew said, look, he's playing with them again. And it never dawned on me like and it hit me hard. I started to (laughs) tear. It hit me hard. I saw that movie three times in that weekend with my nephews. We had it on DVD Mm -hmm. and I cried in separate places all three times. (laughs) It was great when she waves goodbye with Woody's hand at the end. Oh, it's Mm -hmm. so sweet. It's so sweet. So yeah, that's number one on my list. If it was going to be a list, I just kind of, you know, put them on that kind of stuff. So yeah, Mm -hmm. Toy Story. Great. Um, I've got, uh, I mean, 
I've got uh, number. I guess number one on my list, if you wanted to call it number one, is Star Wars. I mean, the original trilogy. Um, I mean, they're both trilogies. You have the one, two, and three, and then you have four, five, and six. But um, the and the other thing I wanted to bring up is that most of these trilogies started with a single movie and only became trilogies because of the popularity of the first movie, or at least the success. The however much success there were there none of none of the movies that are in. Um, my list, that's not true. Lord of the Rings is the only one. What um, about Batman? What about Dark Knight? Uh, you mean Batman Begins? Yeah. Wasn't that was... intended to be a trilogy? I, I'm i not... Oh, I mean, okay, so anything that is, you know, superhero-related DC or Marvel, they're probably gunning for a trilogy. Right. And by that time... It, I have a lot of, like, older trilogies that are kind of before the... Right. You know, the big trilogy push let me stop you for just a split second did you see uh what the first trilogy or what's considered the first trilogy of all time is what is it star wars oh really i thought it was a godfather but actually part one and part two are 72 and 74 and then 89 and then 89 and star wars is the first one in 77 and goes on every three years yeah 80 and 83 Yeah. yeah yeah So, well, that's interesting, but, uh, but yeah, the Lord of the Rings, they shot all three at the same time. So, I mean, they were committed for new line was committed for three movies. And that was three books too. So yeah, it's not like it was a surprise. And if one was a failure, they weren't going to make a second one, you know? Yeah, exactly. But, but still, I mean, they still committed. It's not like they like kind of trotted out. I mean, there've been so many, like, I haven't seen it, but there was one that was like Percy Jackson and the lightning guy. (laughs) And, and it's not, I, and I don't think, you know how they do like these, like, here's the title of the movie, you know, this is the person and the bloody blah. Yeah. Like Harry Potter. That, yes. Uh, but you notice that if there's never any other movies, then they could have just called it Percy Percy Jackson. Jackson, Yeah. Well, that's based on a book series too. So. Okay. Well, but it obviously, I guess it wasn't successful enough for them to make any more movies, but that, that's, I guess what I'm trying to say is that. Is that if it weren't for the success of Star Wars, uh, of the A New first Hope? One? Yeah. First of all, it wasn't called A New Hope in the in the I mean in the the crawl it was, but in the oh uh, no, it's just in, called, it was Star called Star Wars. Yeah. I mean that's all it was called. Yeah. So it was only rebranded, you know, Star Wars: colon, A New Hope once they were, I guess, starting to make uh, Empire Strikes Back and all that. But um, so the reason why I like that trilogy so much is because the second movie commits to a second act of a full story. Right. I mean, the end of that movie is just kind of depressing. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, on Solos and Carbonite, and uh, you're just kind of like, see you next time. Mm. I, I mean, think it's, it's one of a kind in the fact that it does end on a down note. It's, yeah. it's some kind of, they did something online, I forget where I saw it, where they were talking about films that you would think would have these epic endings. and Like that, the end of Star Wars. I mean, they all get medals. Yeah, right. And you they know? try to recreate that feeling in Phantom Menace and yada yada. The rest of them, I have my mm-hmm. own nicknames for those movies. It's not Eesh. appropriate for <laughs> younger ears. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that Empire stood out so strongly because it did end on a down note or not an uplifting note. Exactly. Yeah, interesting. But then it also, I mean, it does so much because it it gets you to. I mean, could you? I can't. I mean, did did did, were, did you go to Star or the Empire Strikes Back in the theater at all? Yep. Or? Okay, I sure did. And then when you left, like, were you just like, I can't wait for the next one? Uh, you know, I don't. I don't remember that as a kid because I don't really. I didn't. I. I don't think. I don't think I thought, oh, there would be, be a next one. Yeah, wow. I just was excited that there was. I mean, my brother was just smart when we were kids. He knew to go, here, listen to this band, and it was you too. He was mm-hmm. like, they're going to be big. Trust me, listen to this band. And he took myself and my sister, and we were nine and six or ten and four. I don't, I, we're all yeah. about two and a half years apart. But he he took us to the mall. Well, my mom took us to the mall. And he, uh, he was old enough to watch us. And he trotted us into the theater, got us front row, and waited for tickets. And, and then he, so sweet, he read the opening crawl yeah oh, to my cool. sister because she was too young to read it yeah and I, that's a very vivid memory and he was like we got to see this movie we got to see this movie and, and you know we were literally on our chairs at the end ah! and great. then i guess i just never thought should there be a part two i just i you know i always thought the ending of it was you know you see darth vader's 
uh, 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 Fighter. Yes, thank you. It's spinning out of control, and you're like, okay, that's not ended. That's not an ending. So I guess maybe in my childhood mind, I, ne- I didn't think there'd be a second one. But I remember when the second one came out, when Empire came out, I, I couldn't sleep. I was like, oh, <laughs> I got to see this. And maybe I thought there should there is there going to be a third one? But I don't. I don't really think it that way. Right. But I do now. <laughs> well, no. Yeah, I do now. But but that's also an interesting way to look at it. Is just like this is it. I mean, that's that's Han Solo's in Carbonite forever. You know. I mean, or like it's not like it's not like the end of Star Wars. It's just kind of like a reality check, I guess, right. for a kid. You know. Yeah, yeah like, that's well, true. Sometimes things just don't work out. Yeah. You know? Well, that's actually sometimes you get your hand chopped off. Yeah. You know? that's, yeah. Sometimes you end up in Carbonite. Well, let me ask you this: Do you think? And this is one of my uh, interesting points for me about trilogies. The second film in a trilogy sometimes, and there's an exception, big time with the Dark Knight for this rule, um, and Toy Story. I'll give you an example, Lord of the Rings. The second movie, almost to me, you do you need to see that second film in order to understand the first film better and then trip into the third one and... It, and resolve yeah. the do you, story. Does yeah. it continue the story on to where now the third one's going to complete it? Because you and I have talked uh, off episode about... Whether or not, if you were to choose to watch all the best picture winners, okay, and then you came on upon Return of the King, the third Lord of the Rings film, would you be able to sit down and watch that film without the first two films? I have watched it trying to put my mind into that set of, okay, well, you wouldn't really need to know that. You really, and with the, and I kind of would. Uh, venture to say that yeah you could you could watch Return of the King and get everything you needed to know there might be a few things that might be a little hard to understand Kate Blanchett's character you mm-hmm. know because she sort of is not as prominent in the the third one as she is in the first one and so forth and so on but would you need the second film in a trilogy to continue on do you need Empire to continue on I would venture to say with that one yes mm-hmm. that continues on yeah, because I mean, there the stakes are much less if you don't have the Empire Strikes Back lens. If you're not watching Return of the Jedi through the Empire Strikes Back lens, oh right. Because the other thing is, is you've got. I mean, you're also adding in at this point in time. Re- Return of the Jedi is rolling in uh, the Ewoks, and I mean yeah. these these things that are that may have ulterior motives as far as like. I mean, from uh, a cynical franchising standpoint, and see, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah, the yeah. franchise is, hey, it's we need cynical. little things for kids to, yeah. to buy, yeah. and okay, they're Ewoks, you know. Um, they're super cute, though. <laughs> I like the Ewoks. I do. <laughs> well, I was going to say, um, the, interestingly enough, the Dark Knight series, the middle film, could stand alone but I don't think the first and sec- and third film could stand alone by themselves. You couldn't watch uh, Dark Knight Rises because you wouldn't know who Ra's al Ghul was. You wouldn't mm-hmm. know who certain characters were. It wouldn't be an impact that it was Ra's al Ghul's daughter who was doing this to Bruce Wayne yeah. based on... You know, and even things that happen. Yeah, in yeah. Games, yeah. Bane even says, "I'm fulfilling Ra- Ra's al Ghul's destiny." So that might not make sense. But the Dark Knight, the Dark Knight. Yeah. You, what you don't need to know what happened before and after. It's yeah, kind of, that's kind of brilliant. It kind of breaks the pattern a little bit. It, it does, and and it and it also raises the level of the trilogy in Dark Knight. I mean, it deals with issues that are not. I mean, that may very well be dealt with in comic books all the time, but I, I haven't read many comic books. But basically, when the Joker has the two uh, fairies of the two different people in yeah it. yeah yeah yeah. and you've got this kind of like a choice like a humanity choice yeah. that has to happen and there's not really necessarily uh an easy out for that situation then that i mean it's those types of things where people aren't i mean especially in like superhero movies people aren't usually don't usually have to deal with those kinds of like questions it's just kind of like these are the bad guys these are the good guys okay well let's fight and the good guys are gonna win and that's it but in the dark knight it kind of like questions like what if you change your outlook to like nobody's good and nobody's bad and everybody just is and then now let's attack that situation you know that those are things that that yeah people aren't i mean it's not uh it's it's not a you know cut and dried you know 
this is the good guy, this is the bad guy. Right. Kind of thing, so. And he kind of uh, mirrors that in Dark Knight Rises because Bane gives the controller to the bomb to a citizen. Mm-hmm. And it all depends on what. And he's sort of making a social issue about um, giving back the the rule of the land to the people instead of it being this corrupt land of Gotham and so forth and so on. Mm-hmm. I love that speech that Tom Hardy has. Give back to you, the people. I love that. <laughs> I love that. It's a bad imitation, but people know who, who've seen the movie will understand it. But yeah, he sort of does that same thing and then twists it with who does have the controller to the bomb, which is fascinating to me. Mm-hmm. That's a definite standout trilogy. Yeah. And I'm wondering what it would be like to watch Dark Knight Rises without knowing. Um, I think you would get it, but then when you watch the first one, you would go, oh. Well, and, and I think that Nolan and David Goyer, whoever wrote that movie, yeah. uh, did a good job of establishing the ideology of the joker from the very beginning because you have the the bank robbery scene yeah where everybody's just killing each other and that right there is something that sets you know it's like there there's no there's no conscience to this guy there's no you know code that he's living by really other than just his own what what he thinks and and there's no he's not living by any kind of uh external code so so that gets you right in. Whereas, I mean, I don't know with uh, with Dark Knight Rises. There's an, I mean, it's an amazing sequence with the plane and you know Bane breaking in and chopping off the tail of the plane and all that stuff. I mean, yeah, that's an awesome sequence. But it's hard to really. You got to kind of figure out what's going on. Okay, they're transferring blood from somebody, and now yeah, that's a they're... bit. That took me like a second time to go. Wait, what? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So okay, now I got to figure it out afterwards. But yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I, I feel like Dark Knight was handled in some ways a little bit better than than Dark Dark Knight Rises. But um, what, what what's your next one? Well, well, we talked about Star Wars. We talked about Toy Story, and we talked about Lord of the Rings. Mm-hmm. And those are three that I think fulfill what we have been talking about, with maybe the exception of the Lord of the Rings with the second film. I, I love the Two Towers, and I love those films. Mm-hmm. But there's something about it that I don't know. It just doesn't seem like you would need it to tell the story. I don't. There's no reason to. What's this? I mean, I get it when I'm watching the film that this world is at stake and mm-hmm. it's now about mankind and how they're going to have to take over and rule and all that other stuff. I get that, but you could have gotten all of that in The Return yeah. of the King. There's a lot of great things that happen in the Two Towers. Don't get me wrong. I'm not. But then there's things like the Helm's Deep uh, battle. Yeah. It, it's kind of like okay, so they need a battle scene in right. yeah. two towers. Yeah. Okay. Well, then so. We'll and there's this epic Deep. battle scene, and then at the end, uh, uh, Gandalf says, or yeah, Gandalf says, uh, "Well, that's just the beginning. The real war is about to start." And you're like, "Wait, holy cow!" What? <laughs> yeah, I-, I love the battle at Helm's Deep. I love everything about the movie. I'm just sometimes wondering, you know, would you need it? It's just a question to yeah. ponder. Um, so one of the other ones I wanted to bring up was uh, the. Girl with the Dragon Tattoo trilogy. Did you know it was called the Millennium Trilogy? Yeah. Why is that? I think it's because isn't his um his uh, magazine called Millennium? Whose magazine? The, the guy the, who wrote the Daniel Craig guy. Oh, the, oh, the I character. see. Yes. Okay. You're right. You're right. I never put that together. When I yeah, the it's not Daniel Craig in the original. Okay. One, but yeah, I know Michael it, Norquist. It, well, hey, man, that's good. the actor. <laughs> Is that really his name? Yeah. Okay. He's he's the bad guy in um, uh, Mission Impossible Four. Oh yeah, Small World. That's huh? the only other movie I've seen him in. So right. But know. anyway, the the. The interesting thing about this is that a lot of people think that the second and third film are weaker than the first one. But when I was thinking about this uh, for this show, I like the second and third one. And you have not seen... I saw the first one. Okay, I so seen you've the seen the original the... Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, but you've not seen the girl play with fire? No. Okay. No, no. Well, a lot of people say that it weakens the trilogy, the second one and the third one, that you didn't really need it, so forth and so on. What I find interesting is is that the girl with the dragon tattoo is really not about her. Mm. It's really about the mystery that he's trying to solve, yeah. the Daniel Craig. What's his name? Michael Norquist. Good job. <laughs> I'm glad you can do that because I can. Um, but the second and third one are definitely about her. So the first one's about a mystery. The second one is 
Uh, Isn't there like her history or yeah, something? Well, yes. It's more of a revenge film. It's more about why. Oh, so the first one wasn't a yeah, revenge well, film? <laughs> yeah. Come on. Well, no. I mean, <laughs> but it's more about him finding out what's going on with that family with her assistants. Okay. Mm-hmm. You think she does some revenging in the first one? Wait till you see the second one. Jeez. Because it explains all of why she is who she is. Mm -hmm. It goes into those details. And then the third one, interestingly enough, and that's the word of the show, interesting, it's it's sort of a courtroom drama. It's, they put her on trial. She's, yeah, it's, it's an interesting trilogy. And I think that uh, it's one of those ones that I don't really think people think of it as a trilogy because they think of the first film and they don't really a lot of people haven't seen the second and don't third move one. Past to the yeah. other ones. And you had said that Fincher is not planning on doing Well, I don't even know if they're gonna be made. I don't even know if Daniel Craig and uh and uh Rooney Mara have signed on for the other two. Right. Like I don't know if they had to because sometimes you have to kind of yeah. like sign sign for one, two, and three. Lord of the Rings did that. There yeah. yeah. Well, but those were shot concurrently. But yeah. uh I mean there's other ones like uh Avengers when they you know whatever somebody signs on for Avengers well they they sign on for Avengers one Avengers two right there's a big deal about Robert Downey Jr. coming back for Iron Man three and then doing the Avengers two yeah there was a yeah. whole deal with his with his whole situation yeah, yeah. yeah. but I, I encourage you to check these out because okay. they're interesting I don't think the second and third are as Impactic, or as in, uh, there's an explosion about the first one. There's a mm-hmm. there's something going on. I guess because it's a mystery and you're trying to figure it out and all that other stuff. But the second and third one is definitely something you should watch. Okay, cool. Um, Back to the Future. That is my next one I want to talk about because that does fall into the this is a popular movie. We need to make some more. But the way that they went about that, and they also shot. Back to the Future 3, right after Back to the Future 2. Oh, I thought they shot a lot of it I at the same time. I don't know if it was concurrent or not. I'm not really sure. Um, but I do know that the thing that blew my mind is that I'm sitting in the theater as a little kid watching Back to the Future 2. And then when the, when the movie's over, I see a trailer for yeah. Back to the Future 3. And I was like, you're kidding me. You know, I, w- I didn't even know. Because usually you would think that, you know... Because I'd seen other movies that you you just have to wait, you know. Yeah. You don't get to see like here's what happens next, you know. Like you don't. I hadn't seen that before. No, does that happen right after the film ends, or did you have to wait I don't for think the you have to wait for the credits? Oh, okay. Yeah, I think so, they only started doing that like pretty, you know, yeah. recently. I guess you know within the last fifteen years. Yeah, or and it's starting to get lame too. They're well, starting to give these little. Marvel te- is yes. They're starting getting to get lame. It's like that's not. We waited for that. Exactly. You even but hear you know oh, what? Oh man! You in the saw theater. you saw the thousands of people that were visual effects artists on the movie. Yeah, so. there you go. Mm-hmm. There you go. But uh, okay, so. I just love the way that I mean you've got the first movie and that's a standalone movie and it's a brilliant movie, um, but seeing what they did with the second and third one and yeah, knowing where does it go? Yeah. and knowing in this it's not like they did made the second one they're like ah oh, what can we do you know and then they made the third one they had it planned out and it all fits together in a nice little bow and I love that about it, especially since it's a time travel movie um, and some people have challenged the physics of time travel in that well but you know that's just gonna happen so it's a movie yeah based on a concept that doesn't really exist yet so we've talked about that you know i actually prefer the second and third one i love the second one yeah i I like the third one a lot too Mm -hmm. yeah the first one we talked about this i was a little bit older when it came out maybe that had something to do with it i Mm -hmm. don't know something about it didn't really i just watched that on repeat that first one i just kept because it was on like hbo i think and my parents recorded it and i just kept watching it over and over again. that's awesome i mean it was there there were a few movies that i did that with and that was definitely one of them but um so yeah the second and, and third movies i i felt like they did i mean there were jokes in there that i didn't get but i totally get now you know like the jaws 17 oh yeah yeah, yeah. you know and 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 they you know just sending things up i just love it's so much more interesting to me, to see what they thought the future was going to be like in 1989, what they thought that a year and a month is going to be like. It's it's happening in a year and a month. I think it's October 22nd, 2015. Have you seen the things on, uh, I think it's Facebook, where they've put what 
uh, Marty McFly look like at 40 in the movie and what I saw that uh, yeah and the only one that looks right is Biff <laughs> really yeah no, I haven't seen that one yeah everybody else looks yeah totally I mean because they've had work done on their face and no stuff. Leah Thompson no Leah Thompson does not look like Leah Thompson from the future in oh Back no to the future but it's not because she's had, you're saying she had plastic surgery now I don't know if she did or not Michael J Fox hasn't I probably not but <laughs> Cynical, cynical <laughs> world we live in, young man. But, Come on. But still, you know what I mean? Like, everybody looks good. Crispin Glover looks good. You know, But he wasn't in the second one, which is a no. whole nother thing. I think they the got second a guy it, to look like Crispin yeah, Glover. That was a little one. weird. That yeah. was a little weird. He's a bit off. He's yeah. very off. Yeah. And you can't he's, say he's a bit off. Yeah, he, uh, he has a reputation of being hard to work with, so, and it kind of matches. But you know what, though? He is an artist, and it's... It, it, They're all cuckoo. Can, you no, know, but what I'm saying is that, like, you can respect because he doesn't necessarily, like, kowtow to yeah, what other sure. people have to say. And I'm sure he's lost jobs, and I'm sure he's made, you know, people mad, and he's probably had a much, you know, lesser career because of his because of his backbone than other people have had. So yeah, fair enough. In some ways you can, you got to respect that. But. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's Lord of the Rings trilogy for me. And then we already talked about the Godfather, I guess a little bit. Yeah. But. See, this is a, this is one that I find interesting because everybody put this on the list when I was looking them up online. I actually don't think that that's a trilogy. I know it is, but in my mind, I don't think of it as a trilogy. I think of it as part one, part two, and part three. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because part one and part two, they connect in a way because they're only a couple years apart. Mm -hmm. And then part three, as a film, a lot of people go right at Sofia Coppola, and she is weak. She is the weakest link in the movie, but she's not as bad as everybody makes her out to be. I feel bad for her. Why don't they go at, at Francis Ford Coppola? As, right. as it being a kind of a cash grab. Right. Well, I no, mean, what happened was Renona Ryder was cast in the role mm -hmm. and she got sick and had to uh, come out of the film, had to bail out of the film. Mm -hmm. And then at the last minute, he cast his daughter. I'm not even talking about his casting. I'm talking about the movie itself. Uh, Should the movie have been made? Uh, what, oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. a third saying. Godfather movie. There, yeah. Yeah, you got a point. You got a point. It's not a bad movie structurally. It fits with the Godfather theme, and there's the some generational yeah, theme. Yeah, I and see. Andy yeah. Garcia is brilliant in it. And I, I don't know if I've ever said this when we were talking about this, but Al Pacino was nominated for supporting actor for the first film, and he was pissed because he says that he's the lead, and he is the lead. I, yeah. he is the lead. The movie's about him. Mm -hmm. Not The Godfather, even yeah. though it's titled that Marlon Brando won the Oscar. The second film, of course, is about Michael, and he was nominated for Best Actor. The third film he was not nominated for, and I think it's the better of the three performances. Hmm. That When he sees what happens to his daughter at the end, and he's on the staircase, and he does that silent cry thing, mm. it's devastating. He, he's on point in that, that film. But I just don't think of it as a trilogy. I don't think that the second one supports the third one. I don't think the third one makes the second one make any more sense it just yeah. it's it's three separate films it's kind of like three time pieces it's yeah. like it's like let's look at this time or this transitionary period let's look at this transitionary period or history yeah like the second one is kind of like has the flashback at, um, component to it right and then the third one is another transitionary period so. and i actually other than the first two being called the godfather really the first one the, really is not the same storyline on any level. I, I think you could watch Godfather 2 and not have seen the first or third one and not need to know anything about anything. Yeah. You wouldn't need to know it. And same with the first one. Mm -hmm. The first one, now let me ask you this. When the first one came out and it did so well and won all the Oscars, had he already pre-planned to do a second one? Because it was right on his heels. Yeah, I don't know. They were about two years apart, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, 72 and 74. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I do know that... The conversation was around there. Yeah. In 73, I think. Yeah. And I think that was the reason why Coppola even did The Godfather is so that he could get the money to do the conversation with, with Gene Hackman. Right. You mean the second Godfather or the first one? I thought it was I thought it was the second Godfather, but um Yeah, but, but they're maybe, on maybe the not. heels. So does that uh, does that 
bode well for your theory about if one does financially well, then they're ready to make a second one. I don't think that really existed. Well, wasn't then. it a really popular book before he even made the first movie? Yeah. So I think that may have been the impetus to make the movie. Right. And then they get they give Francis Ford Coppola the money, they get Marlon Brando, and then they they basically piece together a, you know. They were trying to piece together a blockbuster before there were blockbusters. Right. So. Well, they made you know they were making a great film. Yeah, and I think Godfather Two is the only movie in Oscar history to win Best Picture, a part two. Oh. Do you okay. know what the only uh, movie in Oscar hi- history? Well, there's two that are part threes that won Best Picture. What? Toy Story Three didn't win Best Picture, won Best Animated, but it was oh, yeah, nominated okay. in Lord of the Rings. Return well, yeah, of the that's King. true. Return that's the King. only one. Yeah. So it looks like uh, the conversation came out uh, in 1974, uh, the same year that Godfather Part Two came out. So I'm assuming that um, either he made them concurrently. I don't know. I, I just I read that somewhere. Either he he basically agreed to Godfather Part Two so that he could get the funding for Conversation. Conversation's a pretty small movie. Yeah. Um, and and so he may have you know committed to Godfather Part Two, shot the Conversation, and then shot. Godfather Part Two, and they both came out the same year. I don't know. Here's but. here's another reason why I don't really consider it a trilogy, although I know it is because there's three parts. But the when you watch the first movie, you're like, "This is great." Mm-hmm. Then you watch the second movie, and you go, "This is better." Yeah. Then you watch the first movie again, and you go, "No, this one's better." And you go back and forth, and there are aspects about both films that are really like. And then you go, "Third one's good," you know. Third, mm-hmm. and I don't know if it could have ever held up to mm-hmm. the first two, but. It just, it lacks something to complete the story to make it, you know, a three part. It might and be maybe the, it's the writing, you know? Maybe I think the writing's okay. It's just, there's something just not there for me on that film. Although I watch them uh, at least once a year, there are certain films I watch every year Star Wars on May the 4th. Um, and yeah, I do. <laughs> and I love it. And it, it, it gives me an excuse to watch them, to be honest with you. And then there's this almost itching feeling that comes up and I'm like, Oh, I got to watch the Godfathers and I'll usually watch them back to back. And I'm never dissatisfied after the third one, but there's maybe it's a time frame between the two that mm-hmm. just, they feel disconnected. You know, the first two are connected because they're closer. I don't know. There's just something, I, everybody has it on the list as best trilogy ever. And I'm like, uh, did you forget about the third one? <laughs> it's mm-hmm. not the greatest film in the world. Yeah. It's not bad, but anyway, so did you have anything more on your list? Uh, I can just a couple that I can mention. I mean, we've talked about the matrix trilogy in the past, yeah. but, um, that was definitely one of the ones where they made a, they made the movie and then, it's all of a sudden it's like this is huge get back in the writer's room and figure out the next two and i think the wachowskis wanted to to make a, a an epic trilogy but i mean a lot of people don't don't see it as an epic trilogy they see it as a really good first movie and then a kind of a sputtering second and third movie i, I ten, agree i tend to like the second movie for the visceral feeling that i get when i watch it and the third movie loses a lot of that because it spends a lot more time trying to like fix itself, you know, with the architect and all this stuff. It tries to like, it tries to Tetris itself into a, you know, into a spot where everything works out and it doesn't. That's a good point. Yeah. That's a good way to put that too. The, the thing for the second and third one for me yet again, do you need the second film to make the third film? Do you need the second film to complete? It, 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 it turned in on itself idea-wise. It comes down to one basic concept for me when he says the reason why it gets Neo out of the Matrix. Mm-hmm. He, the Oracle prophesies when the one returns, it hails the destruction of the Matrix. This is not what happens. Mm-hmm. And really, Reloaded is what happens at the end of Revolutions. It just resets itself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, they, try to, they try to please... I mean, they try to humanize the machines. Well, what are we going to do with this big mm-hmm. machine world? We're going to blow it up because that's what we're expecting you exactly. to do. Blow it up. He should have blown it up. I mean, I get it. He went with their Messiah thing and then then Smith. And there's some great things about the second film. I love mm-hmm. the twins. Yeah. The twins are great. Yeah. The, the, how they repeated Trinity's famous, you know. The kick. Yeah, the kick. Yeah. How they kept repeating that. It's good. Um, there's... There's lots of weaknesses. I like the the key maker. I like um, what's the... But all of these things you're talking about, you're talking about the key maker. You're talking about this mythology that they're building up and building up. Yeah. But they couldn't expand it. They couldn't. It couldn't bloom because they had to finish it in the third movie. Right. And so it 
it makes me think that like nowadays with the types of shows that we have available on television, could you imagine a matrix environment in which you have 10 episodes a year, like an HBO five, show? Yeah. yeah that'd five be great. seasons. So you got like 50 hour long episodes to expand this and to, to, you don't have to like tie it all up in a n- nice bow in a second hour and a half or two hour long movie. You can make, you can make it grow and, and, and you got a key maker and you can have a whole subplot with the key maker and a whole subplot with these other things. And it can, you know, get big and you don't have to close it all down again so quickly. And I think that's kind of what, maybe it's what the Wachowskis dreamed about, but at the time they just couldn't do it. And yeah. It fell in on itself. You know, yeah. I actually think if you watch uh, a couple of the animatrix in between the first and second film and then watch a couple mo- more in between, how many are there? Nine, I think. I think so, yeah. yeah. So you watch four and in between it will kind of fill in the gaps mm-hmm. and that actually makes it a better trilogy for me with yeah. the animatrix. I actually think the animatrix is way more interesting than it's the really second good. two films. Yeah, it's, it's really, really well done. I mean, there's there's some great I mean, the first movie, the first little mini movie with with the almost lifelike uh, you know, animation. Yeah. They did the Final Fantasy. Those same people I think did the Final Fantasy movie. Oh, Have okay. You heard of that? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah. So, um so yeah, that I never saw it, but I did see the animatrix one and uh and yeah it looks good i mean it's still that weird kind of uncanny valley thing where it doesn't look just right you know yeah. faces aren't right or mouths don't move right and the eyes are just buggy but um is that still, a technical term engineer buggy well i mean i just mean like they they don't yeah i know what you're saying yeah i know what you're saying but i mean they've gotten better at it so uh and then the other ones that Things that people don't necessarily associate as trilogies. Have you heard of the Cornetto trilogy? No. Uh, Edgar Wright, Simon Pegg, and uh, and Nick Frost. So uh, Edgar Wright's a director. Simon Pegg and Nick Frost uh, were in Shaun of the Dead. Yeah, I know exactly who he is. Yeah, uh, and then uh, Hot Fuzz was the second one. Yeah, and then the third one just came out. Like two years ago, I guess, uh, World's End. Which I loved. Yeah. I loved it. Yeah. I had no idea where it was going, and then boom, there it is, and you're like... I know. And they don't even say, we're not going to apologize at all, make this big switch, here it goes, yep. this is what's going on, deal with it. Because you think it's it. about exactly. a pup crawl, a reunion, and then boom, no. it's something completely different. I loved it. Yeah. No, it's, it's great. So that's technically considered by those people... A trilogy. Okay. A corne- and they call it the Cornetto trilogy because in the in Shaun of the Dead, they're like, I'm going out to get a Cornetto, which is a little uh, ice cream oh, okay. thing. That yeah, they I've have never in, seen it. Uh, you've never seen the Cornetto? Shaun of the Dead. Oh, Shaun of the Dead? Yeah, no. You'll have to borrow it. Yeah. It's it's a lot of fun. And people keep recommending everything in its time, you know? Yeah. It's, it's funny how I've seen the third one and not the first two. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and I love Hot Fudge. Hot, hot Fudge. I do love Hot Fudge, actually. <laughs> Um, not by itself. It would be really weird to eat. Uh, but uh, I, I do love Hot Fuzz, the movie Hot Fuzz. Yeah, it's I haven't seen it. It's so much fun. Oh, it's great. Um, and uh, on the same track, you've got uh, the uh, Evil Dead trilogy. Have you seen Is any it of those? considered a trilogy? I'm confused about this. There's three this. movies, yeah. and they all have the same main character. So Evil Dead... Evil Dead 2, or uh, yes. uh, Army of Darkness. Is, is Evil Dead 3, technically. Okay. Yeah. So Evil Dead is is a movie that Sam Raimi and his brother and Bruce Campbell made basically in a high school gym over a summer, I think. And they did it all on their own on film before you could just like, you know, take a handy cam and make a movie. And... That movie is it's a it's a pretty rough movie as far as like the the effects and stuff in it the like gore effects and stuff are are okay but they were they basically remade it in Evil Dead Two it's pretty much the same story okay in Evil Dead Two and then Army of Darkness is a whole another thing yeah it's basically uh, Ash the main character goes into another dimension and comes out in a Chase trying to the find Argonauts the book. type. Yeah. The, trying to find the Necronomicon. Yeah. yeah. Um, and he shows up in a Jason and the Argonauts type of a time. And with the skeletons. The, and, yeah, yeah, I like it's the it. The Harryhausen stuff. Yeah. yeah I like with it. the skeletons and stuff. So yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. Um, and then uh, there's, there's another trilogy that I uh, got uh, turned on to. Oh, and you've seen Old Boy. Yes. Um, and that's actually in the middle of a, a 
the Chan Wook Park trilogy uh, that they call the Vengeance trilogy. Okay. Uh, it started off with a movie called Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, um, which is uh, it, the main character is, is a guy. Um, and then you've got Old Boy. Uh, and then Lady Vengeance is the third movie where the main character is, is a woman. Um, and it's all about... Um, it's not necessarily all about people who are, you know, uh, you know, imprisoned, uh, falsely or anything like that. It's not like it's that tight. It's just what happens when someone seeks revenge and it may not go the best. Okay. So are there the same characters in each film? No. Nope. See, is that a trilogy then? Or is it just... It's a thematic a, trilogy. Right. It's like red, it's, blue, and white. Yeah. It's the loosest type of trilogy yeah. that you can have. Only Juliette Binoche is in one of the two of the three films. Yeah. But think, is she the same character in... I can't remember. I okay. think I've only seen one of them. I think I saw Blue. I don't. I, yeah. I, don't I started remember. watching I Blue see at him. some time. Yeah. Julie Delphi's in one of them. Oh, is she? I think she's in White. That, it's yeah. like a comedy. Oh, is it? White. Yeah. One of them is a. Com- I think it's White. Yeah. Is a comedy. And those were made with the director's intention, but are, is that a trilogy? It's. it's by a, our definition. It, well, I'd say by our definition, no. Right. Okay. Because it's. It's a thematic trilogy, probably, where he wants to hit right. certain sure. things in each one of those movies. Same thing with this one. It's focusing on uh, either, I guess, an emotion. The Vengeance trilogy is focusing on what uh, what happens when emotion overtakes you and you have you you enact a certain type of revenge. You know, like you're you can't just sit back and let this go. You have to it out there and, well old boy and, is definitely about revenge all yep. the way around and so is lady vengeance it's been a while since i've seen sympathy for mr vengeance i do remember so basically sympathy for mr vengeance uh he gets his kidney stolen okay um, like in a bathtub yeah in the, the hotel? whole bathtub okay <laughs> oh yeah it's very the classic bathtub thing yeah um but uh and then he you know he wants to go figure out who did that so he he goes in gets into this you know world of it's Korean right mm-hmm. yeah they're all uh, South Korean movies the the well I saw both the Spike Lee and the original Old Boy and I saw Spike Lee's Old Boy with Josh Brolin before I saw the original and okay. there's something very Saturday Night Live skittish about meaning skit mm-hmm. about some of the sequences in Old Boy it's it almost seemed to me like they were making fun of the mm. exaggerated emotions and the Korean dialect and the whole. Are you thinking in Spike Lee's version? No, no, no. Oh, okay. In the original version, mm-hmm. like the big battle in the original version. Yeah, it seems just a tad bit exaggerated to where almost I was chuckling a little bit because, you know, I I don't want to do any cliche stereotype. Whoa! Well, but it seems like that. Do you know what's interesting is that it's based on a manga. Uh, it's a, it's a, I guess it's, I don't know if it's Korean or Japanese or what, but it's, it's a comic book. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But there's something about, I don't know. There's something about the way that the, you know, their eyes bug out and, you know, their faces are shaking and I, mm-hmm. and it's in, um, What's the film that's just like the Hunger Games that everybody thinks the Hunger Games was based oh, on? Battle Royale. Yeah, it's there too. Uh, you're and right. They, I don't know if I'm supposed to laugh or. It's yeah, a because the camera thing. comes in all of a sudden and the eyes are going and. <laughs> and I mean, it's terrible. I don't want to be, you know, like, I don't want to stereotype or cliche yeah. anybody, but to me, I had a hard time connecting with the emotions of the original Old Boy because I was like, is this supposed to be farcical or a little bit over the top? Or are we supposed to. It's not like uh, a, Kur- a Kur- Kurosawa film where you cannot laugh at a lot of those films because it's very serious. Yeah. But the the Spike Lee film, you know, they took it very seriously. And yeah. you know, some of the emotions are exaggerated because the storyline's pretty exaggerated and quite strange. And I actually found the Spike Lee film stranger in its approach than the original, like the whole suitcase in the in the field and him coming out of the suitcase and all that stuff. You remember that? Yeah. Yeah. It seemed way more surreal in the Spike Lee version, which I thought was interesting because and you it would, may have been how he shot it too. Yeah, true. I mean you you've also got I, I think I think Old Boy came out in like oh three or something. And okay. so and it's also made over in, in Korea. So maybe I mean I'm sure that the budget was much smaller and then they may have not had the same type of 
Well, they definitely didn't have the same type of technology. I mean, as far as color grading and all that stuff yeah. is concerned back then. But yeah, I mean, you can make that surreal. I mean, not, maybe the maybe the grass was like a specific type of fake grass or something and made it look a certain way or something in the new old boy that yeah and i really yeah. thought josh brolin had a banner year that year because he was really great in that he was really great in labor day which is not a great film mm -hmm. but he had a really good year yeah. and it's a shame that well not a shame but you know for whatever reason those films didn't call enough attention to his performances because it's borderline oscar nomination for me in old boy because he is really great in that and um Elizabeth uh, um, Olsen. Olsen, yeah, she's good in it too. Mm -hmm. She's really good in it too. So yeah, it's it, it's funny how people group trilogies because I'm not really sure that is one. That would but, be that would be yeah. the only. I mean, the only thing that like I said, the only thing that's tying that together is a theme. Yeah, but but, but I guess that could be a definition of something. Yeah, but ultimately it doesn't fall into my definition, I guess. And so I I couldn't couldn't. I just wanted to definitely like bring that to people's attention because anytime I have the ability to kind of like. I mean, th there's those Korean movies, and I've only seen kind of the most popular ones yeah. that are easily accessible. The Host is another one that's a kind of a monster movie. Yeah, I've heard of it. Um, I want to see it. It's fun. Yeah. It's yeah. fun. I mean, it's not nothing that's. I mean, it's. I mean, I'd put it on par with Cloverfield as far as like which I, mean, I liked. Yeah, I liked it too. It's not a found footage movie like Cloverfield is, but but I'd put it on par with that as far as like even the effects look really good. I mean, it's. You know, it's it's a fun movie, I think. So, um, well, I mean, if we don't have anything else. Well, we were talking talk about, about Sonnenberg trilogies. earlier and yeah. the Oceans trilogy. That's right. Yeah. yeah. I think it's a good one. I think it's a good one. We don't have to, you know, expand too much on it. I think the first one is the best one of the bunch, of course. Mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the third one. The second one's a little bit weaker for me. But the thing that I, I like about this is, would you think it, do you think it falls under the category the first one did really well, so they did a second and third one? I, you know what? The Oceans trilogy is so interesting to me because everybody in those movies wants to be there. I was just going to go there. Yeah. I was going to say. So you, I don't think it matters. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. Exactly. Yeah, I'm on the same page about that because I think to myself, any anybody like Matt Damon and George Clooney and Brad Pitt, you, their status in Hollywood is uh, that's backing for them that's a financial backing for them their name where you place it on a on a poster that's all an important part of that game so mm -hmm. for them to take scale which is yep. what sixty thousand dollars for a film it's, which yeah, is nothing. a lot of money for me but for them that's nothing mm -hmm. they did they and those movies are not uncomplicated it's not like they could just go and sit there and read some lines and then him film it there there was complicated things they had to do so yeah. they put their effort into it and then then it all works out to where they rise above everything. And, you know, it's, I think it's an interesting film. All three of them are interesting films. I think the first one is great because you're like, wait, what just happened? And that would, what, oh, well, and it's misdirection in the mm -hmm. best way. And you're thinking, you're knowing exactly what's going to happen. Second one, not as much. Third one, they did much better with it. And then, the, of course, you always have to add a new character, Catherine Zeta Jones. And, uh, uh, bring one character back, Julia Roberts, you know, that kind of stuff, meaning mm -hmm. bring her character, minimize her character a little yes. bit. And that might be for a lot of different reasons. But well, maybe she wasn't available. But yeah, I true. Mean, really, on the second one, I mean, they had to kind of like get out of, you know, get out of Vegas because they needed to change their scenery. Right. And they just happened to use George Clooney's villa in Italy, which so. he just got married in the. Italy oh, he did? did? Yeah, he just got married. Yeah, you didn't uh, know that? Hmm, Ooh, no. You have definitely not <laughs> been. <laughs> Rock, <laughs> you are. That, it's all the rage, man. Everybody's talking about it. Is he got into? So he finally got married. Yeah, he finally got married. He okay. got on the little boats and went down. You know the the water to the gondolas. The, yeah, and all that. yeah, yeah. Well, no, he had big uh, power boats because he took the whole wedding party down. Oh, and here's what's interesting about this guy: he knows he's a huge star. He knows he's going to make a splash. Instead of hiding behind. Uh, umbrellas and and doorways and curtains and stuff like that. He was like, okay, we're gonna get married and we're gonna show everything by going down. That he went by tourist boats and waved to them and stuff. So like in a lot of ways, he's he's kind of like disabling the money making. That's machine. exactly what he did. Okay. That's there was no paparazzi shot because. Mm -hmm. 
there everybody could have taken the shot. As a matter of fact, the boat slowed down in front of tourists and then they waved and they kissed for everybody. So we made all of these paparazzis. Yeah, they're like oh, worthless. Yeah, yeah absolutely <laughs> brilliant. Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. So anyway, so uh and, you know, Soderbergh, one last point. He is the kind of director that does something that's huge like this, but then also created something like traffic and then mm-hmm. all these other smaller films that he's done. So I, I find it interesting that somebody who could continue on doing these huge films especially after this franchise was so popular and made a ton of money but he didn't and now since what you told me at the beginning of the show (laughs) now he's recutting movies that are 33 years old brilliant (laughs) that's really great (laughs) all right uh well next week we're going to talk about uh the new david fincher movie gone girl so i'm very excited about that it's been I don't know how many years since uh, Girl with Dragon Tattoo, 2011, I think. So it's been three years. Yeah, it's not so long. Well, he did Social Network in 2010, and then Dragon Tattoo in 2011, and then he did House of Cards. Yeah. So I guess I did get to see a David Fincher directed Not like this, though. A year ago, a year and a half yeah. ago, but no, not like this. So, and that's the other thing I was going to say is that I watched the first two trailers, and we talked about those trailers mm-hmm. on the podcast. But I've purposefully stayed away from the TV spots, the TV ads, because I've started to notice that TV ads give away give away way too much. Yeah, I think it's just because they're trying to scrape the bottom of the barrel of people to just get them out of their house and get them to the theater. Whereas people like me and yeah. you, like we've been, I've been looking forward to at least. I'll speak for myself. I've been looking forward to Gone Girl ever since oh about a year ago when I found out that they were going to shoot in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, which was like four hours away from me. That's three cool. And a half hours away. I mean, so yeah, David Finch was like three and a half hours away from me for like months, and uh, yeah, so I, mean, hey. I, I never made it down there or anything, but it's still pretty neat though that that they shot. In Missouri, I don't know how much they shot. Ever since you've come from Missouri, I've started to notice all these films, and you started pointing this out. I'm like, that is a very popular place. Winter's for- Bone. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. It's Did set I know in that? Missouri? I believe it was shot in Missouri. Well, yeah. in the Ozarks. Yeah. Road trip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know if I'd want to go to that lake. <laughs> oh yeah, no. <laughs> don't go there. No. Uh, okay, well, uh, if you want to check us out on the web, uh, our website is actorandengineer.com. On Facebook, it's facebook.com slash actorandengineer. And follow us on Twitter. Uh, and our handle on Twitter is at actorengineer. So uh, I guess uh, we'll see you next week. Until then. Bye. Bye.